12th in the morning, I had a doctor call me from the hospital saying, I need you to come in. She was an on-call doctor. And I said, I'm okay. I'll see my doctor tomorrow. My daughter wasn't due until September 11th. So I was not anticipating having a baby on August 16th. My own thought was like, this is crazy, but I'll appease her. We arrived at the hospital and just when we arrived and I stepped out of the car, I started collapsing. Oh my God, I can't breathe. I started hearing the nurse telling me, stay with us, Mandy, stay with us. And I started hearing them saying, we're losing her. And when that happened, I just like shot up out of my body and I was watching from overhead. About that time in the sky, there opened up this big, massive, bright light. It was so beautiful and it just felt like I was supposed to go there. So I went through the light and as I was going through, there was darkness on either side. It was like it was going through a tunnel. And finally, I arrived on the other side and it was like this bright light just spread open. It, it looked like I shouldn't even see anything. It was so bright, but it was so beautiful at the same time. And then closer toward the, the 10th day, I had another time where I distinctly remember that I had flatlined and I was actually gone for 20 minutes is what they said. They had already said that I had died and had told my family. What happened was I saw colors that I've never seen on our planet. I know it sounds crazy because I didn't really 100% believe in this until it happened to me. And now I'm like, wow, this is just amazing. Hello and welcome to another Oliver Schiller show with me, the host Oliver. And today on the other side of the globe as well, um, the Pacific coast of the US is Mandy. We connected two, three weeks ago over a Facebook group from Mind Valley, we had to, um, where you posted some very vulnerable message you received 28 years ago that 2020 will be very important for you. And I, I wrote back to you that I'm doing podcasts. And then we had a very long talk last week, which was very insightful for me. And now you're here. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me as your guest. Yes. Yeah, so let me like, let you introduce yourself a bit for the guests. Um, I know that you're a teacher with, um, uh, how you call it? <laughs> with uh, the hands. Deaf students and I use sign language. Yes. With sign language. I didn't remember how you call it in uh, the right terms. So three things to describe you personally, professionally, you can use one word, so you can use sentence. It's up to you how you would describe yourself. Uh, I think that I'm a compassionate person and I, uh, three words. <laughs> or, or, or you can also describe yourself like, you know, like right. what you're doing and stuff like that. Um, I love helping people and I work with uh, deaf and hard of hearing students and I teach them. And I've been doing that off and on for the last 20 years. And I currently live in Reno, Nevada, but I was living up at the Arctic Circle area and also teaching um, Native Alaskan students. And it was awesome. Okay. So, so compassionate, love, helping, and teaching. What brought you into the... No, let, no don't go that deep yet. Uh, if you put uh, be the new color in a color box, which color would you be and why? Um, well, I'll just say my two favorite colors are pink and green. And if you know anything about the heart chakra, that's the, <laughs> the heart chakra colors. Um, and it's just, I, I love exhibiting that love and compassion and happiness and whatever I can do to help other people. So those, that's my colors. So pink is a heart chakra color. I didn't know. I knew green is. Right. Um, I've also been told that it is um, a heart chakra color as well. So, um, and I've always enjoyed those colors even before I knew that. 
So it's, it's a funny combination. And I, to, I imagine it in my head. <laughs> so I, does it come in stripes or does it come with points? Or it... <laughs> well, usually how I think when you actually said that, I always think of flowers that are pink flowers and then um, the green, the stem and the leaf. And so that's how I always kind of envision those two colors. Yes, of course. I just, yeah, because I was just like thinking how to combine them. Um, that was more graphical. Super. Uh, do you have any secret people don't know that? Like only very few people know. It's it's not like it did um, something crazy, but uh, I had someone with the which did uh, medieval martial arts with the long sword, right? Like the Game of Thrones kind of martial arts. Another one has frogs to remind him that to do the hard work first, like eat the frog first. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> do you have something like that or? Um... Uh, not really. Um, I, I don't have anything that I, I do as a ritual or anything. Um, but probably one thing that people don't know is that most of when I lived up in Alaska, every day I flew on a Cessna plane to go from village to village. And oh. so I, um, I did learn how to fly and most people don't know that about me. So you were flying your own airplane. I actually, usually I was the co-pilot okay. because, um, there was the pilot, but I made sure that I learned how to fly because if something happened to the pilot, I was the only other person on board. And we would sometimes get into blizzards and all sorts of issues up in the air. And I was like, oh, I really need to know how to, to fly. Okay. Yeah. That's a nice secret. <laughs> <laughs> so how are those planes? Are those the ones which go land on water or like the planes or what is it? I have been on the water planes, but these were just like the little uh, Cessna planes. They're just little bitty Sometimes they only seat four people oh, and that, yeah. and you can't put too much into the tail cause you don't want to weigh it down. Okay. So you went, so your work day was basically flying from place to place or was it like one day, one place and another day, another place. Right. And no, sometimes I was on what they call a milk run and, um, and that's from village to village to village during that time frame, And. I just helped to make sure that medical supplies and stuff were get, um, were getting to the children in the villages. And it was an exciting time in my life. And sometimes I was on dog sled and sometimes I was on snowmobile or ATV. And they don't really have a road system up there. So, um, so okay. you had to have different ways to get around, which that's kind of what people didn't understand how I li lived up there and I loved it. Okay. So how did you come up there? How did well, what, it, what? Yeah. Well, how did you end up uh, having that job? Oh, yes. Um, I actually was, um, it's been a number of years ago. I was actually going through a divorce, which I was very sad about. Yeah. Um, okay. but I was trying to go back to Texas where my family's from and a on came the screen and said, would you like an exciting job? And I applied for a job in Alaska. And it originally was to be a behavior specialist, which I know nothing about. And they interviewed me for two hours. And I thought, well, this is crazy. They're interviewing me for two hours on a job that I know nothing about. But what I found out what it was, was to be the coordinator of the entire state of Alaska for um, birth to three-year-old deaf and hard of hearing. And so they were actually had looked at my resume and realized that I would be a great fit for this other position that I actually got. And it was an amazing time. Well, because you already had the experience uh, with handling kids, which are deaf and Right. Okay. And, so there was just a screen. So I, was that on the airport or where did you see that screen? Which said like. Oh, on my computer. It was on my computer screen. I was looking for jobs in Texas. Uh -huh. And then uh, one of those advertisements came up. And this was so many years ago before we have a technology like we have today. But it just 
popped up on my screen and I thought, oh, let me just check into it. And uh, it was just on a whim and it worked out and it was fantastic. Wow. I mean, it seems so little, but actually it, it has changed a lot in your life doing that. And it, it might have been on purpose that you saw this. Exactly. I don't think that it was an accident. I think that it was absolutely meant to happen. Um, once I arrived there, I still have so many friends back in Alaska. And I love every minute that I was up there. Um, you have the 24 hours of daylight during the summer. And then in the uh, winter, it was most of the time it was almost completely dark. And then the sun would come up on the horizon and go back down. And uh, oh. so I always saw the sunrise and the sunset during the winters. Yeah, you got up for sunrise, sunset. Well, well it wasn't One out coffee, for... right? One coffee was enough for both. There you go. That's it. It was fantastic. So you have a sunset, sunrise. So how, how did you handle... Yeah, let, let's just go with the flow here. How did you handle that the winter? I mean, I live in Denmark. Now we are, it's the 23rd of June. So the longest day, uh, like 21st, 22nd, 23rd, these are like the longest days in Denmark. And it's not really getting dark. It is dark, right. but it's not, if you have clouds, right? If it's a rainy day, you have black, pitch black. But if it's a sunny day with no clouds, you can walk at least for five days all night Eight. without needing lamps. So how was it then? But, and the winter is four-ish, four o'clock-ish that it gets dark, right? And only at nine-ish gets it's light. And it's very hard for many people. But if you go all the way up and you have sunrise, sunset in the same time, you don't really get sun um, or, you know, exposure. So how how is the feeling? Um, How I dealt with it was I learned that there was like four different shades of darkness. And so, so I would wait and, and look, um, it would be pitch black during the night. And then kind of, even though the sun wasn't really coming up, you could make out the buildings that were in the area. And then you would just look for different types of, um, of light, even though it was dark, if that makes sense. Oh, and, and, uh, emotionally. And then emotionally, it um, it is draining. And so I had a, what's called a sad light. And you end up using that. Most people do. They use a light to just kind of help them to boost up their energy and to also feel happier. But as time went on, I definitely felt really happy being there because you could go outside and you could see the roar borealis at certain times. And then... What I also learned when I was there was if it's cold enough outside, um, the air kind of just lingers. So you actually see crystals in the sky and you can part them. And so they're, they're ice crystals that uh, just hang out in the, in the air. But that means you're also kind of breathing in and it's just very cold. But it was so interesting. Oh my God, this sounds just like Matrix or something like that. But air is, and you go between, wow. Right. How did it you feel the first time you experienced that? When you, the first time you saw this, what was, what was your feeling? Well, at the first time, and I guess what it is, is it's like a fog or something, but I just kind of was hesitant to, to walk through. Yeah. But then I saw other people walking through and the air just kind of departs <laughs> and parts out from the, the crystals. So I was like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is cool to think about it, it. It didn't happen very many times, but just to have that experience was just amazing. And um, everything up there was just amazing. There, there's the tundra. So when you walk, you kind of sink down and, and come back up. I always did feel like I was on a different planet up there, but... Um, the people are so nice and it's just, um, and everyone helps everyone else out. So it's just amazing. How, would it, how is it with the wildlife there? I mean, there must be ice bears, like polar bears, sorry, in English, and uh, grizzlies and wolves. Exactly. I did see um, the grizzly bears or black bears um, 
And then I also saw polar bears and um, just a few times. I had one polar bear that actually, I before it was aware of polar bears, I was um, walking from the tarmac of the, what's considered an airport, but it's not really. It's just <laughs> kind of a little space. And I was walking towards the village. And by the time I got to the village, people started talking about that the polar bear was following me and it literally had tempted over um the trash and it was rather frightening to me after the whole ordeal but um they said that they can track people up to a hundred miles away i don't know if that's true or not but <laughs> but i never wanted to encounter that again because i was just clueless at that time Okay, and, so you um, didn't see and then him. I he, saw another polar bear. So I he didn't was just see behind him. You. Uh, so how how far away did they say he was like very close? Or I'm was not he... even. I'm not even sure how far it was away from me. But they said that if he wanted to, you know, have charged or ran at me, that that would have just been the end. So, um. And I just hear that they're very mean. So I was a little worried. They look so cute when you see them on TV, but I've seen one in person and, uh, and it was fishing and, um, for, you know, fish, but I never want to be too close to one. They're gigantic. <laughs> yeah. We have here in Copenhagen, they, they have a really nice, uh, cage for the bears where you can go underneath them and also a glass wall on the side so they are huge and when they swim there you really see how big they are and they get so close to the glass exactly and i did work at the alaskan zoo so we had one named louie and he would come up to the glass and i just remember those paws being so big yeah so so you must have some protecting angels there that uh that he didn't charge for you. I I believe that I do. Um, there's been so many incidences that I've had throughout my life, and they I always come out on the positive side. So you have. Uh, I mean, uh, let's go to the incidences. But before, how long have you been in Alaska? Did you say? Um, I was there for almost ten years, but now wow. I live in Reno, Nevada, and um, and I love it here too. I live by Lake Tahoe, which is beautiful. Yeah, I heard that name many times. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, even as a European, you hear about the Lake Tahoe. <laughs> it, it's considered one of the most beautiful places in the world. So that, there we go. that might be why. I don't think many people have heard of Struva before, but... Uh... <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not so sad about that. It's, it's not a big place. Um, Yes, so you have been 10 years in, in Alaska. Anything else that, yeah, that you take, took with you and you, you, you kind of have good feelings about besides all the travels and sleighs and polar bears you see and learning to fly <laughs> and the people you right. meet? Um, other good feelings. Definitely, I think everyone will usually mention their children, but definitely my children are a highlight of my life and... Yeah. So, are, they, uh, are they still in uh, in Alaska or are they somewhere else? Oh, um, actually, one is in Texas right now, and she's my daughter. But she's there. Um, she's twenty eight years old, and then there's my son, who is um going to be twenty four this next week, and he's in Pennsylvania, and so they're already grown and out and on their own. Uh, have they been with you in Alaska or? Um, when I was in Alaska, they actually were, um, the one was in Pennsylvania. Again, they were in Pennsylvania and then Texas, but they were with me um, quite often in Alaska too. And how did they like it being up there? Oh, they loved it. They thought that it was wonderful. And um, my daughter likes uh, Mount Denali. It's one of the tallest mountains. It's just beautiful. And then my son just loved all of Alaska. It didn't matter. As long as he was venturing out, he loved it. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have friends in Yukon. Actually, my old neighbors, they moved out to Yukon. 
And then uh, the girls moved to Vancouver, but I know now the older one is uh, a ranger in uh, Yukon. That is wonderful. And that's so beautiful. <laughs> I see that you, 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 ha you talk a lot with the hands, but you're actually talking with the hands, not like the Italians, which... Right, they're going, and I'm I'm signing a little. That's that's beautiful. Yeah, so it's it's a habit of yours to talk with the sign language because you have done it so much over time for people which have to have that, right? Exactly. I've been doing that off and on for the last twenty years, so it just automatically people will go, "What are you doing?" <laughs> and it's my hands, and sometimes I'll even sign and go, what is that word in English? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, let's, let's put this, the thing aside. So I, uh, let's go for the, uh, the sign language. Um, I've always wondered if, if you speak sign language, can you talk to anyone around the world? Like Chinese, Arabic, Russian, German? Is it the same or is it different? It's so different. That's a misconception. There's American Sign Language, which is what I know. There's British Sign Language, India oh. Sign Language, um, Span uh, Spanish Sign Language. And um, even in Africa, there's different signs as well. Um, so just all over the world, it's different. And I've actually taught students from different locations. They've come in from around the world. But when I... For instance, when I had one student from Africa, they kept going like this. And I was like, I don't know what that means. And this is father in American Sign Language. Yeah. This was um, father in his language because most of the men in his village smoked cigars. So this was <laughs> like a cigar for father. And then us, it's father. Yeah, like you, you touched the forehead, which I don't know. What will, why that is? I can understand the cigar holding, but it's also so. Do you have the dialects also in America, depending where you are in the region? And um, yes, and there's over, um, like there's just over 100 signs for pizza. So there's, um, yeah, this is pizza, 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 um, and I forgot one of the other signs. That's usually the two signs that I use is pizza and, um, but it's just. Yeah, there's different signs for everything, even like birthday. Um, they have different signs in different locations too. Okay, now I understand because uh, we talked on the talk last week that I, that or did we? That our daughter got, um, I think, six CDs or DVDs where we had some sign languages as we speak, spoke four languages at home. And the like help was like one hand is lifting up the other one. And I think uh, Poo Poo is like... <laughs> Putting the right. Thumb on. That's correct. And like, thank you is basically uh, a kiss from, yeah, from the cheek, uh, from this, not from the cheek, from the chin. Uh, exactly. And then thirsty, I think, was like just drinking. Mm -hmm. uh, but I tried with some people and they didn't understand and then I gave up. Uh, but that must also be because it must have been an American DVD. Um, and then if I try to talk to someone which knows sign language in Denmark, they use different signs. But how comes there are so many? I mean, um, it's just like the rest of us in the world. We grow up in different locations. And so you're just trying to speak to the people in your community. And then all of a sudden you see that these languages um, arise in that location and that they'll look different from location to location. Okay, so it's just an organic growth over hundreds of years of trying to communicate with people which cannot verbalize or it, hear. Exactly. And it, American Sign Language actually started um, with the over in France. Um, we had an American that went over to France trying to figure out how can they sign. And so they we picked up um, more of a French-based sign rather than the British Sign Language. Um, and you would think that we would have had more of the British sign language being that we're from the United States and speak English and, um, but it, it comes from France. So actually when you're signing in American sign language, you're, um, following more of the structure of French. Okay. So, but how old is sign language officially? Um, 
I think that it's um, about 150 years old now. Okay. Somewhere around there. I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. But well, I of know course, that before, was, before was whatever, right? But Exactly. And every language has pretty much come up with, but they, um, what we have found is that there's definitely a structure um, with the resign language. And then there's definitely different meanings, um, just like in different cultures with different languages. Um, so we have found quite a bit of, of different things and how signs are put together. They're just like when we create words, um, they're creating signs as well. So. <laughs> yeah, and you're still talking with the hands. I don't see everything, which is a bit sad because I oh. think we're going to put that on YouTube. So, I mean, you're, you're, this episode is definitely worth on YouTube because you use that. <laughs> right. Um, if I could be able to speak uh, sign language, you could actually make uh, a version for people which need it. Uh, but another question is, oh, is there also... Um, uh, a universal sign language. So when you travel the world, like English is basically a universal language when you travel, because most of the places, if you don't speak the language, somehow you should find someone which speaks English in some degree, right? Is there also it, something like that for sign language? Uh, my understanding, I'm not as knowledgeable on this. Um, I have a friend that has been to like a conference that was a world conference and she said that there was something more of a universal um signing that was there but for myself i don't have that experience so i'm not exactly a hundred percent sure on that okay yeah but that's uh that's good enough we take you're on the podcast and i just go with the flow as we were told so um, why did, yeah, the question I stopped before, uh, because I wanted to continue with the caller was, how did you end up, um, yeah, your, your metier, your, your job as a sign language expert with kids, what was the drive for you to go there? Believe it or not, it started at age four. <laughs> um, oh. I... I was out playing with all of the other children on the block that I grew up on. And there was a little girl that was sitting on a porch across the street. And she just kept staring at us. And I kept saying, come play with us. And she just sat there. And my mother finally told me she was deaf. And I said, I have to learn how to talk to her. Um, she only was an our neighborhood during the summertime because she went to the school for the deaf, which was in another city. And then she would come back during the summer times. So I saw her a few more times and then I started learning sign language. But before I could talk to her, she moved away, her family and her moved away. So I do not know who this little girl is. And I'll probably never know, but she inspired my whole life. Okay. So you learned the sign language. Where did you learn it? I actually didn't learn. I learned a little bit when I was in middle school and high school, but I didn't really learn sign language until I got into college. And that's when I finally um, took off and uh, learned it. And then my master's program was actually in sign language. And at that point, that's when I really started mastering sign language because if I didn't, I would miss homework assignments and other things that were important to the class. So. Because the whole communication was in sign language. Mm -hmm. It was. So how many years did, was that school where you had to use sign language? as a means of communication was um, that one year one semester or was that oh no it was um a two-year program and so for that two years all of my classes were in sign and then sometimes they would have someone that would voice uh for the teacher depending on who was in the classroom but there were many classes where the teacher would just sign only and uh, which was a great experience because 
when you're immersed into the language, then you absolutely have to learn it. And yes, as, I mean, it's yeah. with all the languages, if you speak, I mean, I use a lot the hand, which is this difficult for Danes, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we can actually go into that as well. But I'm Swiss and I don't know if, if I use a lot my body language as a Swiss more than normal Swiss do, but I definitely know Italians when you're, when I'm around Italians or Latinos, it's, it's, it, I'm not standing out because they use the body to, to speak. And they definitely do. They're constantly moving. And, um, and actually if you're not aware, 80% of our language, um, is our body language. So people talk. And that's just 20% of the communication. And, but most of our communicating is through our body language. And most people don't realize that. So you might be standing in front of someone and you're giving all kinds of information by how you're standing, by how your facial expression is, by kind of what you're doing. And that usually you can tell, oh, someone's interested in, in this, that what I'm talking about, or, or you can tell that oh they're not interested at all but they keep going oh yeah I'm interested and you can just see it in their body language that they're not um or maybe that's just something that I've picked up over the years because I uh, I work with all of these students and they used to tell me when I would come into class I I went in sick one day and the students I kept going yeah Hey, I'm great. I'm fine. I'm wonderful. And <laughs> all of the deaf students kept going, no, you're, you're sick. Something's wrong. Are you sad or are you sick? So they could tell right away all the hearing people, not one of them asked me if I was sick. They okay, all so, thought it was okay. So you had a, a blending, uh, a mixed class with deaf people and you were using voice and sign language to give. Class. Right. Um, I'm usually what I am as an itinerant teacher. So I usually go from class to class and my students get um, mainstream. And then I just come in to kind of help out in those situations to see if they need any help with their work or is there something going on with the sound system that I can help to improve it in the classroom? Is there something that maybe the teacher needs to be able to communicate better with the student? And then making sure that the student's sitting in the right place and that nothing's blocking um, their view from seeing the teacher. And, and are just, they uh, lip reading mostly or were they able they, to lip read or like mouth reading or how we call it? Oh, um, that's a good question. Some of them do um, do the lip reading, but others we have a sign um, interpreter in the classroom with them. Okay, so ah, so you were not like fixed, but so there was the teacher and then the sign interpreter next to it. Right, exactly. And I actually did that one year was the interpreter for a classroom and uh and it can be challenging at times to try to get all of the information then give it out to the student and because you're lagging behind about seven seconds from what the teacher says to the student, and you start realizing the teacher needs to pause because by the time you get a question out to the student, the other kids have already raised their hand and the teacher's already called on someone for the answer. And, and you're like, well, that the deaf student missed again. Um, so that's one of the things that I do now is I let teachers know you need to pause to give the interpreter time to get the message across to the deaf student and then have the deaf student have a second to actually be able to think of what the answer is and then be able to respond with the rest of the students. Yeah, because otherwise they feel discriminated in some way because oh. they can never really speak up and then they are getting disconnected, I guess, from, from the class. Exactly. Because if you cannot answer, right. Uh, I had a question in my head. Now you nicely explained what you were doing from, from your sick day when you come in and you speak. And the deaf students could tell that you're not well. Do you think because of using sign language, they're more attentive to the body language? Definitely. They definitely are picking up because even the body um, lets 
us know even in sign language kind of what's going on with people and facial expressions are a big thing um to to let people know are you asking a question is this a statement or what's yeah. happening so did that help you also to read people better i mean you mentioned it a little bit before Right. I think over the years, it definitely has, because I can pick up on cues from people where I'm still waiting for hearing people to pick up and they don't always pick it up. And then I go, hey, did you notice? And they'll go, no, I didn't. Um, but sometimes I think as hearing people, we do notice some things because we'll automatically without someone talking to you, you'll go, oh, I don't have a good feeling. I need to walk away or oh, I can tell the person's really interested because they're leaning towards me. And so you keep talking. And so things like that. Yeah, so, sorry, my, I Even moved my laptop. people are picking up. <laughs> oh, no problem. <laughs> um, yeah, because I have a hot laptop on my, on my leg. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> no, so I was just thinking because there's um, James Abel, I think it's his name, uh, fat burning man or something like that is his podcast it's it's many years ago i listened to him and i re recall that he was a musician i think guitar playing if i'm not wrong before and he was overweight and etc and then he learned he was on medication and then so um james abel then learned that his diet was wrong but anyway it was not about that that's the start of his podcast but he he mentioned about listening to other people, he could hear how they are because he played music. And he realized that when he talks to other musicians, the, the conversations were different because musicians can hear in, in your tone if you're lying, if you're truthful, if you're interested, all these kind of cues. And you say, which makes sense that if you speak body language, you have a similar advantage, I would say, because you can you know, people have a harder time to lie to you and you get faster to the truth and to some. Exactly. You can definitely see on people's body language how they're feeling and what they're think, kind of almost what they're thinking. But just like with the musicians, I very much relate to the musicians too, because you do hear um, in voices like the tone changes and it's, it's like, oh, let me read that. What's going on? And it's it's very interesting to actually. Oh, oh you went in secret. What <laughs> I was just thinking, like when I'm in restaurants, um, I don't hear other people's conversations, like at the next table. But there are times where you'll see a group of people, and you can just tell who's really interested. And what's going on and the ones who aren't interested in what's going on and they're looking around or they're fiddling with their phone or they're doing something else or they're, they keep picking up their napkin up and down or they're just doing other things that shows you that they're not really into whatever's being discussed at the table. <laughs> and, and so I always find that interesting, but sometimes people are talking so loud that you also hear their inflection and you can tell this conversation is about something very exciting for this person and then for the other person you'll hear their monotone voice and you're like oh it's not interesting for them so <laughs> they can hear things like that too okay so you're very intuitive i i guess yes <laughs> uh, did you always have i mean we we talked a bit from from being four years old, but did you have that through through all your growing up period from from being a child until you were a teacher that you kind of observed people like that and how they were? I I think I have always observed people and um and then if we come to like with my um my daughter's birth that's when i think things really changed for me um my whole life changed at that point okay so. but uh, that's a nice intro then le let's go there because now we know what you do and you, you're still working as a teacher right with right. sign language and and one of the things that i really i love doing is i've had the <laughs> the pleasure of yes 
I have had the pleasure of um, being on stage with some of the singers since you were talking about music and interpreting music for for deaf people in the audience. They love music. Um, they can feel the vibration. And um, and some of them, if they're hard of hearing, they can hear, but maybe not hear all the words. So um, I don't know if you've heard of Chris Daughtry or Goo Goo Dolls or... Um, sure. Kenny Rogers or any of them, but those are people that I've been on on um, the stage with. Is there any video of that? I'm sorry? Is there any video where you're on the stage? Uh, do you think? No, we didn't video. They were at concerts that were kind of private where they didn't do any videotaping. I know like um, when I did like Smash, I did Smash Mouth and Kenny Rogers and stuff. And at that place, they were literally taking people's phones away from them if they even tried to videotape or take a picture. Um, so, <laughs> sure. okay, I just meant it could have been nice to to link to it to the listeners to see that. I wish I I had that. That those are like highlights in my life without any anything to go with. Yeah, but we will put links to to the musicians you were doing. So. I'll I'll mention them in the show notes. Oh, cool! Yeah, yeah. and Philip Phillips is another one. I just am like Dustin Lynch. I think that I don't know who else, but but what kind of music is it? I mean, Kenny Rogers. I heard the name before, but I'm not really sure. Is that all? It's he's um, he um, is an old country western singer, and then um, Chris Daughtry is more of a up-to-date um, type of music and Philip Phillips, I guess like kind of pop. Okay. And um, and then there's um, Dustin Lynch is, is country. Goo Goo Dolls is from like the 80s um, type music and 90s. Okay. So uh, just a variety. Okay, it's not just like, I, I, I was thinking of country music uh, when I heard it. <laughs> so it's a, it's a blend. Okay, but... Um, Let's get into, yeah, now, now we have introduced you so for, for the listeners uh, and for the ones which are still listening. So now it's, it's how we connected. It's the story of, um, of the birth of your daughter 28 years ago. Uh, right. How it came that, uh, that 2020 was told to be an important year for you or exactly. for the world, I don't know. So yeah, please share your story. Yes. So 28 years ago, I was, um, it was actually August 16th of 1992 and it was a Sunday and it's, it was really bizarre because in the morning I had a doctor call me from the hospital saying, I need you to come in. And she wasn't my doctor. She was an on-call doctor. And I said, oh, I'm okay. I'll see my doctor um, tomorrow. And my daughter wasn't due until September 11th. Um, so oh. I was not anticipating having a baby on August 16th, but I did. Um, so what happened was the, the doctor said, there's a voice that keeps talking to me saying, you have to come in. And I said, well, that's really strange. I think I can just hold off and, uh, <laughs> wait for my own doctor to see me tomorrow. Well, a few hours went by and she called me again and she said, you have to come in. This voice is not letting up. I've never had anything in my whole time that I've been a doctor. This has never happened. You have to come in. Um, if nothing else, just please, because I need this voice to stop. And I don't think it's gonna stop until you come to the hospital and I check you out. So how, how was that at the situation back then in 1992? Did you believe in, in such things that a voice is talking to a person or how, how, how did you feel? I believe that things like that could happen, but I just really on this particular day thought this doctor has lost it. <laughs> and I kept thinking, I don't know that I want to go in with this doctor because this is just very nutty it's not even normal and and so my my own thought was like this is crazy but I'll appease her I'll just go in and and see her 
Um, and I did have toxemia at the time. And I think they call it hypertension today. And so my blood pressure was really high. I was swollen. But again, my doctor had just said, do lay down for the weekend and, and come see me on Monday. Wow. So on, on this Sunday, I did decide to go to the hospital. My mom drove me and my sister also got in the car with us. And we arrived at the hospital. And just when we arrived and I stepped out of the car, um, I started collapsing. It was like I couldn't breathe. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't breathe. Um, and then they got a gurney and got me into a room. But I started hearing the nurse telling me, stay with us, Mandy, stay with us. And I had... Um, started hearing code, code blue being announced on the intercom, code blue, code blue. And that usually means that someone's heart has stopped. And um, at the time, I didn't really realize that that was being announced for me. I could just only keep hearing them. And I started hearing them going, one, two, three, four, five, three. And I kept hearing that over and over again while I was also hearing people yelling, stay with us, stay with us. And then I started hearing them saying, we're losing her, we're losing her. And when that happened, I just like shot up out of my body and I was watching from overhead and I was watching doctors flying into the room and nurses coming into this room. And there was just a massive amount of people. And I'm looking down at myself and I just see them putting all this gear on me and machines and um and then the next thing I know is I see them pushing my mother out the door so I rush out the door with my mother but I'm still up, up in the air watching from above and I see her in the hallway with the nurse and the nurse is saying we don't think we can save your daughter but we are going to work as fast as possible and see if we can save your grandchild if there's anyone that needs to be here, um, they need to get here now. And immediately I went down the hallway where I saw my sister and she's on the, I hear her talking to my father. I all of a sudden arrive at our house and I'm at my, with my dad outside of the truck and he's getting into the truck and I see him getting into the truck truck to come to the hospital and about that time in the sky there opened up this big massive bright light it was so beautiful and it just felt like I was supposed to go there so I went through the light and as I was going through there was um, darkness on either side it was like it was going through a tunnel and um, and finally I arrived on the other side and it was like this bright light just spread open and it looked like I shouldn't even see anything. It was so bright, but it was so beautiful at the same time. And then I saw a great big tree. It was just this massive tree and light was coming out from behind every leaf. And then on the ground, um, it was like every grass blade had light coming out from behind it. Everything had light. Um, and then I started seeing these light beings that were walking towards me from out of like a field coming towards me up under the tree and they all fit under this huge tree but I was just amazed and then two people stepped forward and I had a younger sister who died when she was 12 years old and one of those people was my sister and then there was another lady standing beside her that had her hair up in a bun and, and had um, a blue shirt on and a white dress over the top. And she told me her name was Leela. And so I, I was like, okay. Um, and my sister said, it's not your time to be here. You must go back. And about that time, she had her hands out in front of her and she pulled it for, back towards her. And then I started going back um, through this tunnel and it was just a lot of electrical sounds. It was like ch -ch 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 -ch, going back into my body. And I arrived just in time during the last part of the C-section. And I had the, it, they pulled my daughter out um, and she's screaming and crying. And I got to see her. 
just as she was born, which was amazing. And then I ended up having, I only got to see her for a short time because I was still off and on flatlining. And I flatlined off and on for the next 10 days. And then um, closer toward the, the 10th day, I had another time where I distinctly remember um, that I had flatlined. And then this time um, when I woke up, there was actually just a tube. All the machines were off and there was just a tube in my right arm and they were draining out the blood into this bowl down below. And I set up to ask him what was happening. But pr just prior to that, I had also been back to this wonderful, magnus magnificent, beautiful place. And I have no words to describe some of what I saw. Um, I was actually gone for 20 minutes is what they said during this time frame um, that they had already said that I had died and had told my family. And so this was like 20 minutes later, I, I guess. It, it, but um, what happened was I saw colors that I've never seen on our planet. I can't describe it. And again, everything had this light behind it and this most beautiful, beautiful sounds. I haven't heard anything like that here on earth. And it just, I, I got told, I actually also could just see, I don't know, even know how to describe it because there's no words. Like I felt like I was seeing affinity um, just across an all time happening at the same time. I, I can't even describe what it was. And I also saw that our time frame of how we live as being linear wasn't wasn't what I was seeing time up there. Time was like folding on itself and coming in and out. And I still have no words for what I saw. <laughs> but at that time, that's when I got told that when I turned 52, which is in a month from now, that our world would be in apparel and that it would be time for me to start coming out and trying to help people um, and trying to repair our, our world. But as far as what I know, there's something, a second, I know we've had this pandemic, but there's like a second uh, uh, coming and I don't know exactly all of what that means. And I feel like I'll just get revealed to me as time continues as to what is happening and what I'm supposed to be doing completely. But it's, um, but I just know that this was always my time that this was when my life was going to start taking off and everything I've been through is um, had a purpose for this exact time. How do you come here? What is it we have to do? Mr. Paxton. We have to burn a witch. Oh, that's kind of like a timing in uh, this interview. Ed. Yes, it's an interview. Can you wait for... Okay. So that was the interruption of my daughter. We have to burn a witch. Um, um, what you're saying would not too long ago be called crazy and cuckoo. Yourself would have called that not completely normal. I mean, that's why I ask you how you felt about, you know, someone telling there's a voice saying that you have to come to the hospital. And then now you just like tell us all these things of the beautiful light. When we talked last week, you, you, you said it was just so beautiful. You didn't want to come back to our life because everything was compassion, love. And the question that was asked was like, how can we help you? What do you need? Exactly. And, and that's how I still feel like I still have this yearning of, you know, I would love to be there. And somehow a part of me still sees that like on a daily basis. And I know it sounds crazy because I didn't really a hundred percent believe in this until it happened to me. And now I'm like, wow, this is just amazing. So I usually can tell when someone's going to pass within, you know, three days before they're passing, I can start to feel that they're going to pass over. And it's like, I can also kind of see or envision that side again, when, when this it's, um, Wow. been incredible yeah i mean is that for anyone so if you're in the bus or in the city you can see someone will die 
Or is it someone which is close to you? uh, No, not just close to me. I can feel other people. So like I've been in the grocery store um, and I had someone brush up against me and I just was like, oh, oh, I, I felt like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. I don't feel well. And I felt like I was tumbling and it was so awful. It was a young, younger guy, Mm -hmm. but he got on an ATV after he left the store and he literally rolled and it killed him on his ATV. And I feel like I felt that just moments before it happened. you saw it happen? I could see it in my head, but I could really feel my own self. Like I fell down in the store because I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm, I could feel it happening. And, and then I also was around another guy um, and he was on a motorcycle and I was like, I started feeling like I was choking. And then the next morning he was in a motorcycle wreck and it sliced his throat and he died. And, and so the night before I actually was feeling his, what he was going to go through. And a lot of people I can feel um, just before their death, like what it's feeling like, like if they can't breathe, is their head hurting? Um, or is there something else that's going on? Oh, that's not, uh, so that makes you feel, um, are we in control of the future? Is it already written sometimes? Right? If you can feel it, what happens in the future, right? Right. Well, I, I've actually warned people, you know, like, oh, I think something is going to happen. You need to not do this today or, or whatever. And it seems like, a uh, you know, it can be like a, another week or so, and that will happen anyway. So I've learned just to let it go, breathe in and breathe out and, um, and wish them all wonderful, great things and, and move on if I feel that, cause I don't think I can change it. I haven't ever changed it for anyone. Okay. No, it's, uh, it reminds me of a documentary I saw about, uh, a paper roll in Israel where everything is written on, coded. So you can find yourself and it doesn't really tell you exactly what will happen, but when it happened, it makes sense. Like when you're born, what city you're born, what kind of schools you did, the important things of life are, are written there. And they still don't know how, how that is possible. And, and that's what I've heard also. And and it does kind of make sense because um, when I went to this place and I could see eternity and I saw all time happening at the same time, it seemed like that that there were just certain things in our lives that are key that are meant to happen and they will happen regardless of what we're doing. And that's kind of what I saw um, when I was there. Yeah, so that's definitely could be a title for the show. Certain things are meant to happen. <laughs> yes, definitely. I, I definitely agree with that, that, and I feel like that people that we meet is there's a reason, um, that there's not a real coincidence. There's something that we always have something to learn from someone. So when they enter our life for whatever reason, there's always something that we get back out of it. So we were meant to. To meet, because I'm not so much on Facebook anymore. I know Mind Valley actually was drawing their their group activities on Facebook onto their own uh, platform because they had students which are not on Facebook for different reasons, right? Um, Right. Could be conspiracy reasons for some. It could be privacy reasons for others. For the next, it's just they never went. And so they never really got connected on Facebook. and I just went there and I went through and then I saw Mandy commented and I had probably 30 or something. I just clicked on it, looked at it, saw your story, commented, and you answered very fast. And, uh, yeah, so it most likely it was meant to be because you were also told to share your story. And I asked you about, you know, do you want to be on a podcast? <laughs> exactly. And, and that's, you're actually helping me because you're the first person I'm doing a podcast with. So. I guess I'm not the last one. Um, <laughs> I think the story is very, very important. So yeah, now I'm uh, 
go with the flow. Uh, now I blocked myself a bit by sharing my story. So certain things are meant to be. Uh, so what, what you mentioned before you're told like on the go, what's going to happen. So you have not been told everything. You just have been told in the 92 that in 2020, something is really going to happen. Uh, and then during the time you got more information. So what happened lately? This right. I, I have just had the information of, um, the, that there was going to be this second coming of something that's happening and, um, and I haven't been revealed all the information, but even when I was younger, it was almost like it, there would be a battle or a war or something happening. And, um, and that could just be the, this COVID-19 and is the war, who knows? But what I know is that I was told, try to stay positive and, um, and not get so caught up on the material things or to be caught up in fear. You need to release the fear and to just feel in line. And so what it needs to happen is for everyone is just to keep your energy or vibration. We're all made of a uh, frequency. And so if you can keep your frequency at a higher level, it just helps. And, and a lot of that is um, doing the meditation like you're doing and visualize being positive thoughts. Um, another great ideal is just keeping like a gratitude journal. I keep one myself and it just helps if you write in the morning, uh, jot down like three to five things. It just helps you to feel better throughout the day. Um, and also I know that here in the United States, at least, they keep showing the COVID-19 on, on TV and people are becoming very frightened and scared. But if you just keep a, a positive feeling and, and think, oh, this, I'm healthy, I'm good, I, um, I'm surrounding myself around good people. And then just, again, it's that staying positive type feeling that helps the most but not getting caught up so much in the fear. Yeah. So yeah, you, you say you were told to stay positive, release the fear and not be too materialistic, be in a higher vibration, right? Right. And doing that by meditating and visualization of positive things, gratitude journal, three to five things, and you know, have a positive affirmation about I'm healthy, I'm good. What do you say about forgive, forgiveness practice? Oh, yes. You know what? And, um, and that has been huge for me, especially since um, I had this near-death experience. It was um, then that I realized that forgiving is very important. When we forgive, it is helping ourselves more than it helps the other person. It does no good if you're angry at someone. They don't know you're angry and their life continues to go on as is and they live, you know, however they want to live. If you're not forgiving them, though, you're upset, you're aggravated, you're angry, and you're holding and bottling all of those emotions inside of you. And it somewhere will build up inside your body and it will come out eventually. Um, so if you can just visualize forgiving that person and and letting it go. It doesn't mean that you need to forget. You never need to forget if there's an experience that was horrible and not place yourself back in that environment again. It just means that you're saying, I forgive. And it's more of just letting yourself feel um, this, whatever feeling off of your chest or wherever you're holding it in your body. Because it could be in different locations. It could be someone's having headaches or ache somewhere else, but it's just helping yourself to forgive that person. And then just saying that um, they knew, even if they did know better, even telling yourself that they knew no better than where they were, or that has happened to them. And so they just released it all onto you as well. And, and also that compassion, having that compassion back towards that person is also very helpful. It's, 
I can tell you it's not easy. I've been through a number of things throughout my life, which I think has been preparing me for being here um, starting at 52. Um, I've been in some really bad situations, but it's always helped me just to say, oh, yes, I forgive them so I can feel happy and to all the good stuff into me. Yeah, sorry. I just realized my face is black and white uh, on the <laughs> video, so I'm turning a bit more to the, to the window. I'm standing now instead of sitting. <laughs> so how is the, um, yeah, I mean, you, these things I heard, gratitude journal, meditation, and the forgiveness practice, wh wh when did you start? Do you meditate and visualize? Do you do the gratitude journal and the forgiveness? And when did right. it start for you? I've, um, I've actually been doing like the forgiveness since, um, the day that my daughter was born and onward. It's for just 28 kind of, years. Yes. For 28 years, I've been doing that. And people are always like, that is just crazy. I can't believe you're not mad at this person. Um, I've actually gone and helped people that have been hurtful towards me in the past because I feel like as if I help them. It helps everyone to be healthier and lifts the energy even more. So um, I've always done that. And then gratitude, I will admit, I have done that off and on also for like the last 28 years, but I haven't been as diligent as I feel like I could have been. And I noticed though, when I don't keep a gratitude journal, that my emotions seem to go downward and into a spiral. So when I keep the gratitude and I'm going to let you guys know, there have been times in my life, all I could write in my gratitude was, thank you. I have a blanket. Thank you. I got to eat today. I mean, I have like struggled on some days to go. I need to find something to write that I'm thankful for. Cause there's just sometimes we have a bad day and it's like nothing good happened. Um, but when you really start going back through it, it's like, wow. Um, yeah. The, and then you start thinking about the blanket or something. You're like, this is really comfy and, you know, it's nice on my skin. And so then you start finding more things and all of a sudden you just keep, it starts going that you can write more and more and more things. Okay. So it's because it, now you mentioned you went through the day. Is that, do you do it in the morning or do you do it in the evening? Um, I've done it both. I've done it sometimes at night and then, um, but recently I've been doing it every morning. I get up and I just um, write every single morning a couple of things down. Um, and that seems to help me through my day. And then just like Vision was saying, you know, doing your segments of the day, I think that that kind of helps some somewhat. Um, but, and we also talked, how? Was that the six phase meditation, right? Exactly. Yeah. For, and then uh, just uh, kind of like visualizing that. and visualizing doesn't always work to what you think it is, but I feel like that you have more control, um, of your day, even if it goes array and you feel like it's out of control, but if you visualize, you still have some positive things that you can pull out for the day or try to make those things happen. Yeah, I mean, uh, we talked when just before that I'm, it seems that I'm hypersensitive and I have not really accepted that before, uh, especially the last two full moons I could really feel. And now we are well, the 23rd of, of June. So the solstice, uh, passed and I had, I just told you for the last 10 days, it feels like whatever I'm doing, it just feels like I'm doing the wrong thing, right? It's like. I'm doing something, I visualize it and it shouldn't take that long. And then I can do whatever I can draw. I can prepare the podcast I can find new guests, but somehow the day passes. The thing I started takes all day, even though it should just take two, three hours. And I have the feeling I haven't connected with my family. I have not really relaxed, uh, but uh, it's, it, it tends to be around the full moon time or now solstice. I really feel like unbalanced. You said. You felt unbalanced yesterday, Sunday mm -hmm. a bit, and some people around you felt unbalanced. My wife doesn't say, 
But now when you mention this gratitude and see something positive, I'm because I'm standing up at the window, I'm looking out uh, and see my family. You saw my daughter kept coming in before telling me we're going to burn the bridge. Uh, it looks like they're making popcorn on, on the barbecue grill, on the Weber grill, you know, these round balls. <laughs> and they're having a great time and it fills me up with, with joy, right? It, I feel good, even though I felt bad that I didn't spend time with the kids really uh, this afternoon, even though I was around them. Just because things did not fit like a puzzle piece. Exactly. And that happens sometimes. And I think that's even a great time to pull out your um, journal at night and just go, hey, this happened today. Like I saw my children popping popcorn. And it, and so it's just a great memory. And just writing that down for yourself. And yeah, they were throwing <laughs> popcorn in, into their faces to see how many if they can grab with the mouth. I could just see. <laughs> oh, and see, that's a fun thing too. And you can write that down. That's already two things. Um, and I'm sure that there were other wonderful things that have happened throughout the day. So like even just writing one more thing, that'll give you three things when you go to bed to go, my day was much better than I thought. I mean, let's, let's go to the like routines. Uh, in the beginning, you said you don't have any special routines, but um, I know Tim Ferriss, he was talking probably since 2014, 15 about the five minute journal. I didn't really understand. I understood what he meant, but I couldn't make it happen. Just take a paper and write it down. Uh, last year, 2019 in February, I got a six minute journal from a listener of Tim Ferriss, a hundred percent, because a lot of the notes, the highlights was just reminding me of different. And, oh, no, I, I can hear you. I, I didn't mean to stop you, but I have that intuition of where I hear other things. Another weird thing about me that happened um, whenever I started, whenever I went on this near death experience, and I'm hearing, I'm going, oh, this is great. You're not meant to journal. You're meant to draw. You're meant to paint. That's your journaling. That's what we talked about last week. So, but um, okay, let let uh, no mental note till we come back to the drawing. So I wanted for the listeners about, you know, the five minute journal. So last year I got the six minute journal from a Tim Ferriss listener, which had an accident in, I don't know, Singapore, Malaysia, somewhere. He's German. He traveled with someone, had the motorcycle accident, open cut. He was bleeding to death. Right. People came, looked at him, took videos. And when they realized there's nothing to gain, they left. He was bleeding there in agony. Oh. Um, I don't know what happened with the other motorcycle guy, but eventually there was an Australian dude coming, going to him and say, uh, I don't remember what saying, but like, everything is going to be okay. Bite. I'm here for you, Tack. He, he bound, he was binding the wound. He got him together, got in the hospital. I don't remember where he was in hospital, probably in Malaysia, wherever he was. And he couldn't do anything. And he was like threatened by losing his leg. And he was loving to move. He did football, basketball, all kind of activity sports. And he had all the means to be miserable, right? right. To go down the, the black spiral. And, uh, and I don't know if he knew Tim Ferriss from before and knew about that, but he did the six minute journal. He improved the five minute journal and he was writing down everything positive. Like I'm alive. I could be dead now. Uh, I have great doctors around. I have people taking care of me and, 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 and. And he said, it was funny. People were like, how can you be so positive when you have, you know, you might lose your leg and you love all these activities. And he's like, because I'm focusing on what I have, not on what I don't have. And so the six minute journal compared to the five minute journal, which many people know by now, it's just three things in the morning and three things in the evening. Now, someone stole my five, no, someone took my six minute journal because <laughs> I showed it to her and then. I asked where, where it is and she was already home. And she's like, I took it with me because I like your notes. I'm like, seriously, <laughs> it was for getting an idea so you can do it yourself. You don't have to take my notes. Perhaps I want to read them, right? Right. Uh, it's a really good book. I, I put it on the um, show notes because he's also explaining the psychology behind it. So in the morning, you have like the three things you're grateful for. Uh, you have a positive affirmation about yourself. Could be... He calls it the hammer version, like, like, uh, Jim Carrey did having a $10 million check in his purse and like 
uh, for super good uh, uh, acting qualities or whatever it was, what he was writing there. He had that for 10 years. So you can write something like that every day just to remind right. And writing it with your hand has a positive effect because it goes into somehow into our body. And the other thing was like three things which would make today great. And that's a bit also Vision Lakhiani six phase meditation where you visualize your day from getting up, meditating, eating breakfast, commute, water work, and you see all the positive things. So you prep your brain for, for like a great a meeting with people and you focus on the good things because you're already seeing it, right? Uh, exactly. But these are like things you do in the morning and in the evening, uh, it's also like greatness I saw, right? Like someone held the door open for me. Someone stopped at uh, the red light, even though they had green, but let me pass. Someone let me in front in the line, whatever it is, right? Someone gave me a flower. Um, and things, uh, how I could improve today. If you see like, oh, today was perfect, but you know, I could have perhaps less procrastinated. Like one, two, three, four, five, go, right? That's like a tip for not getting it, stuck. And what exactly. was the other? I don't remember the, the last thing because I don't have the book anymore. <laughs> but it's like, it's, it's sim similar to Vishen Lakhiani's Buddha and the Badass, Be Extraordinary. He also talks about in the evening, look at synchronicities, look at coincidences happening. Because you visualized something and in the evening, did something happen which actually fits to what you visualized for the greater purpose of your life? Exactly. And, and I see that. You see that? And the more synchronicities you see, the more you prepare your brain to actually accept it. And actually, he says also the universe would give more to you because you're now you're attentive. And you say, hey, thank you, universe. You gave me that person which I needed to have in my life to... I don't know, help me. I mean, for me, I talked to a Dane, which has a father from Lebanon or Algeria. So he looks not really Danish, but his, his name is very Danish. And he was a mool, uh, he was a bricklayer in English. And our, my, my wife came this morning and said, do you know a bricklayer? And two hours later, I was talking to that guy and he said he, he was a bricklayer for two years or three years. Uh, he might look at it because it's a very small project. So that's a synchronicity. Exactly. And that's also great things happening. So, so this five, six minute journaling fits a lot with what Vishen Lakhiani says. So if people are any interested, I will put all these links on the show notes or in the blog post. Mm -hmm. And you agree on that. So what, what is your take of what I just said? I, I completely agree with that. When we're focusing in on the positive, I think more positive happens. And there's been times in my life I have focused on you know, oh, this terrible thing happened and then the next terrible thing happens and it's a snowball. <laughs> um, and yes. then what, what I've also noticed is if you start looking at the positive, it can be a snowball too, but it's, uh, it's going up because it's the positive and you get more positive, more positive, more positive. And not to say that things aren't going to happen because there's always going to be things that happen, but um. Even like the other day, I had some stuff that went completely wrong. But what I remember out of the day, most remember out of the day is um, some of the times that I spent with some people and, um, and that went all okay. And I disregarded what the other part that happened. In fact, I'm trying to think of what actually happened because I don't recall, <laughs> um, which is probably a good thing. Um, and, and I think just writing it down, it also, um, there's some psychology that I know that I have done even in the past with students. If you want them to be able to do something positive, you videotape them of doing that positive thing. Like one of them maybe is like, they're just going to try to step up on a curb, but they can't quite step up on the curb. So you take a picture of them at the bottom on the street and then you see them again on the sidewalk. And if you show it to them over and over and, and saying, look, you're so successful. You're on the sidewalk. You got up on the sidewalk from the curb. Um, eventually, they start stepping up and putting their foot up on the curb and then stepping up and then getting onto the sidewalk. Um, and they're, 
very successful. Whereas before they were saying, oh, I can't do this. I can't do this. It's too big of a step. <laughs> and, um, and so just visual, again, it's kind of that visualizing, but they actually had visualizing like pictures of seeing themselves successful. Okay. Um, I just see that as a general methodology to help people to, to see what they can. I mean, I see it. I took a lot of pictures before, like 2019, now 2020, I have done less. But whenever I look at the great pictures I took, I'm like, wow, I was actually really good. And people told me that. But when you do that great work, you don't really realize until for a longer period, because for two years, my bigger iMac, which is standing next to me with the big screens, uh, is broken. I somehow cannot fix it. Uh -huh. And I love to work on that because it was a big screen and all the pictures. And now I work outside and I, even yesterday I went and looked for a, a notepad and I saw drawings I made uh, 20 years ago. I was like, wow, they're detailed and really good from elephants in the zoo because I had um, a free class from the school of art. I was one year and we went on, on Saturday mornings for two hours and then we had to different exercise and we were drawing a lot of elephants also in the museum, the skeleton, just to get to know the skeleton. And then, you know, and I'm like, wow, I was really, really good. But for me, it was just so normal. And I compared myself with other artists, which were really good as well. And they were better, of course, some were better here, some were better there. I just start, start to compare yourself with everyone. And now when I look at it, I'm like, Jesus, that's more than 20 years ago. It's just. Continuing for 20 years, where would I be now? Right. Not comparing, and just listening to yourself. Just try to improve yourself from day to day. Exactly. And that's all we can do at this point is just improve ourselves day to day. And it is hard to not look at people and say, oh, they're doing this much better than I am. But then it's like, um, who's to say we're not doing something well also? And it might inspire someone i know that i think that you're great at, at being an artist and i haven't seen but one piece of your work but I I unfinished. <laughs> unfinished piece. <laughs> but i think that you just have um that's like i just keep hearing that that's like your gift and so you can pick it up now and and start doing it even if it's just that five minutes for journaling and you're just painting for five minutes or drawing for five minutes but that that's it, it's funny because it comes always back and back and back uh it for me taking up a camera and taking pictures it was not difficult because i just see um drawing i i'm sometimes sketching i'm like wow where did that come from many times if if i'm in the flow if i try and force it it's it's not ending in a good way and even though i'm not drawing and sketching much when I'm in the flow, it just w goes well. And people are like, oh, you must be drawing a lot. I'm like, I used to 20 years ago. Um, so there is something in me, which is just um, the interest, the passion, the certain skill set because of the passion, right? Um, you cannot become good if you don't have passion or love for something. Right. And I, I can tell you how passion and, and there's just something that I keep feeling like you get messages always through your hands. Yeah. And <laughs> so... I Must do be. keep, I keep always hearing moving. how important that is. So, you know, taking your pictures with the camera, doing the painting and stuff, I just keep seeing that as being very healthy and beneficial and showing you like what really is great happening in your world. And um, that might even be your journal as your pictures. You take pictures and to you, yeah. you're like, oh, I didn't get to do much of this today, but you can take a picture and then when you look back, you're like, oh, that was a great day. Yeah. Now, where do I have the phone now so I can take a picture of the kids and post it? <laughs> exactly. So let's see. Uh, but the thing is also, I tried the 365 um, Instagram where I take a picture, like the picture has been taken by me. Oops. So uh -huh. Back to normal. Uh, <clears throat> and then I used the smartphone because it was... 2015, where the smartphones got really much more potent in what you can do. And so I tried to have graphics on it or text, but I did it only a little bit more than half a year because it was very time consuming sometimes. Right. For some pictures, I had two and a half hours. I used there, you know, trying different graphics and 
playing around, but I have really many cool pictures from that time just by doing it every day. Right. Um, and the other thing is what I, when you mentioned this journaling by drawing, I hope the listeners are not getting co totally confused here with our talk. Uh, not too many weeks ago, I mean, all this COVID time, everything is kind of m meshing into each other. I don't remember when, what. Uh, we are all home with the family. There's a lot of health summits. There's 5G summits. There's technology. There's meditation summits. There's like so many things I'm absorbing. Um, but there was one class on the TED Talk, and he's talking that he was doing a, a sketch every day for how he feels. Right. Journaling by drawing his feelings. Um, I tried that. It doesn't really work that well for me because I'm ending up doing the same. But I guess it could also be, you know, you do it for a month or something and then things start going. Uh, right. If you're learning things, right? You have to have a certain mileage before anything it, works. Writing, exactly. drawing, coaching. Exactly. And I'm actually hearing that, that it, um, like at the beginning, the drawings are depicting kind of how you feel now, which is, is sometimes maybe not how you want to feel. So drawing, because then eventually it'll get down to, um, I, I'm hearing going down to deeper levels, but it'll finally hit what you need. Okay. So it's basically, but it would fit to the TED talk uh, when he says, because or, or other TED talkers, I guess it came because I was watching a TED talk about journaling, right? Every day, writing down mm -hmm. your feelings, like if, in case of doing a six minute journal, um, it's similar, right? You write down the, the synchronicities you saw or how you feel, what you could do better. Um, something great about you. I guess that was these three things in the evening. You could also feel how I feel, how I felt today. Right. And, and, and I think they will talk about it. It's, it's like, you know, you start to understand yourself better. Exactly. Both ways, like writing down or I guess for someone could also be an audio file, like that you tape yourself talking into an audio recorder. Oh, look at that. I get the popcorn. Oh, yay. Yeah, and and then she's one. going, let's go burn the witch. Let's go burn the witch. Yeah. You already burned it without me? Yep. That's how much uh, patience my kids have. <laughs> oh. It was burning fast. It was like uh -oh. less than a minute and the, the witch burned down. Uh-oh. So, yes, yeah, so... Um, talk. Okay, I've been done. Then... <laughs> We're still interviewing here. <laughs> Uh, they want me to finish. They want to have fun with me. Oh, definitely. I won't keep you much longer because I know that they're they're going, come on, Deb. Yeah, I can see that. They're actually cleaning the, the trampoline now. Yeah, I don't know. There must be popcorn all over the trampoline. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. But um, yeah, I'm a bit um, taken away here. Uh, let, let's continue a little bit more and see where we're going, uh, yeah. um, just to close it off, um, as I said, it's, I told, talked with you that since, since in the middle of this COVID, um, start, I had the feeling like I should change my, my podcast a bit. I wasn't sure I get more spiritual people on it. So far, more spiritual people come to me business wise. I mean, there's business coaches, which are very spiritual thinking. Uh, Vision Lakiani as well, right? He's like talking about Buddha and the Bada as like being spiritual and being a businessman. Uh, exactly. It does not be separate. It can be together. Steve Jobs was very spiritual as well. And many of his ideas came through meditation and visualization. Um, exactly. Now your gifts are uh, hearing voices, if that is the right thing. Right. Are I, those guides I... or angels or what is it? Um, I believe that they're um, guides. They can be angels too. I just um, know that I it, it still comes from that place of what I see as magnificent. And that's where it's coming from because I also always see like um, the light. And, um, and so I, and I also get like a sensation. Um, so I also have like feeling like I will feel sometimes what the other person is feeling. So, and, empathy is another thing but um but yeah i do definitely hear and i'll have them just talk to me while i'm talking to someone and i'm like i oh, know this sounds really strange and i used to just try to ignore it 
and shut it off. But um, usually when I talk to people and I bring up what I'm hearing, they always go, how do you know that? Yes. I mean, let, let's put it for me. I know my wife is not listening to my podcast, otherwise she wouldn't ask uh, what I'm doing all the time. <laughs> but uh, we, are talk we talk about uh, my family, like my kids, my wife, my wife's family, my family, and so on. And you really brought up a lot of points. So I'm like, this makes sense. Right. It, it was kind of putting puzzle pieces. Uh, two weeks ago, I talked to Kimber. Let's hope if, that I also can have an interview of her. She's like a coach for heart-centered intuitive. Mm -hmm. And it also opened up a lot of understanding doors or puzzle pieces. And um, so I can completely confirm that Mandy has this gift and I guess a very, a very accurate. What I have realized when we talked last time, after, we talked about two hours. After we half did. an hour, 45 minutes, I started hearing voices myself. Yes. But I don't hear them now. And my sister, which is an animal communicator, and you said she should be able to help me. She was very intrigued because I talked to her about what we talked or what I could remember. And she said, she doesn't know how to help me. But um, the whole conversation came up because I was sitting. Now, we don't hear it, people. I was thinking of, of taking this uh, interview outside. But whenever I talk to people outside, they hear the, the birds. There's like birds all the time around me. Okay. Uh, and um, so let's see if I have to start learning to listen to animals, like in the Walt Disney movie, that the voices will come to me. But definitely feeling and listening to the heart is definitely something that sometimes works, but I'm working on it. Also, Vision Lakiani's class, the Silva Method and Silva Ultramind should right. help. To, to get more in touch with the intuition. Exactly. And I definitely do feel like that you're getting messages. And I think, like you were saying, when you're outside and in your garden area, mm -hmm. that's when I think you probably pick up messages. And I don't think it's just the birds. I, I feel like you have a connection to the trees there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With, yeah. With all of that. Uh, it, it's funny. We talked about it on Thursday that, the whole journey for me, I mean, I started the podcast in April last year or 1st of May, I think was the first episode live. And in June, I went to Bulgaria, to some Diva retreat, mastermind retreat. And I had a few people from there on my episode. Uh, and we went into a holy place and a church and I was there for like 10 minutes and I could not be in there. I felt like right. pushed out. We talked about it. I tried to connect with the place. Everyone was so ah, this is a great place, lots of energy, but I didn't feel good uh, for whatever reason. And that's when it started that I saw a lot of uh, pine forests, kind of rocky mountains, Yellowstone. I've been in Calgary, right, and, uh, and Vancouver Island, so I've seen. And I feel good. I felt very good in Canada, and the energy was always feeling good. And I it's also visualized Native Americans, and you said you're... Grand grand grandmother was my, the my, daughter of a chief or something like that. Right. My great grandmother was the daughter of the chief and Cherokee and the Chawahani tribe. Okay. You have to write that to me. <laughs> I don't even know how to spell Chawahani. <laughs> okay, I never heard that before, but it's it's interesting because I've seen these images and I'm like, I have no idea where it comes from. It was just there since for a year that I have this feeling I need to go and meet Native Americans and, uh, and be around them. As, but I'm generally interested in meeting uh, old cultures, right? Also Aboriginals and, and so on. But it's from Siberia is another place where I'm kind of feeling like uh, I need to go. I've been in Ecuador in the forest, not with Native people, but uh, it was also nice. But for me, it's more the pine trees. Right. And I feel like that you're supposed to be like the, a healer also. So I get that feeling inside of me. And I think that with being around the Native American people, you'll pick that up. But um, if you come this direction too, you'll, if you, I don't know, just touch the trees. Um, there's, we even have some of the pine trees that you can smell. 
and it smells like vanilla or butterscotch. Really? Uh huh. And so it's, it's, um, I think it's the Ponderosa. Is the Ponderosa? Mm hmm. And they smell like vanilla because we are having a lot of doTERRA essential oils for about two and a half years. And <laughs> we got, we were like waiting for getting some of the pine tree oils. And so we got the Siberian fur, fur and the reaction when I put the drop on my wrist and did like this and pulled in, my whole body was chilled, like chilling. Like I had goosebumps from so my wife as well. Uh, we did it with some other friends. They had no reaction. And a Danish friend of us had the same reaction. It was like not even a second. And the whole body was like. Zzz. Right. So I'm actually curious if, if uh, doTERRA has some essential oils from, from that tree. Yeah, that would be awesome. And just see how, how that feels too. I bet that you'll probably have like this wonderful vibe that goes through you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just this, the smell. I love it. It's, um, but you know, it's like when we go into essential oils, I don't want to go too deep here, but essential oils you can put on the skin and they will go through the body into the blood and then very fast be um, spread through the body. Then you have the smell and then also internal, but internal only if you have the cleanest product ever, right? Because otherwise if you have chemical, but even then yeah. if you have chemical and put it on the skin, it will still go in the blood. So, I mean. Essential oils, get it naturally if, if you can. But I know when you, when you smell it, you, you activate also the other part. It's also exactly. memories sometimes. It does, definitely. It's fantastic because it actually uses other senses that we don't always use. And I just think that's fascinating. Yeah, so for me, the smell, it's just like, I don't know, it's one of my favorite smell is summer summer uh, pine trees like the warmth when you have like i don't know what is it 70 to 80 fahrenheit like the 25 30 degrees sunshine <laughs> june july august perhaps and then you just smell the trees because of the, the uh, what is it called the not the wax the the hearts how is it called in english you know the sticky thing oh the sap yeah the sap <laughs> yeah, i just love the smell and it is, it does smell good. And that's over um, right at Lake Tahoe. You can smell that right now. Oh, okay. So we are, I've just got the message to, to uh, close it down. We're not going into creativity today, but uh, let's see if we do another interview. Do we have any advices you want to give the people? Just stay positive and just make sure that you're um, doing things that you love. And if you can keep that gratitude journal, I think that that's really helpful. And um, I just wish everyone the best, definitely. And hopefully I'll get to talk to some of you guys sometime. Yes, look at my daughter. She's respecting us by massaging herself while we have an interview. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> so at the five minute journal or the gratitude journal, mm -hmm. stay positive and do the things that you love. And that's yeah. not easy. I mean, we can talk a lot about finding the things you love. Exactly. And I, I, I know we all get caught up in our day because I even get caught up in my day and then it's late at night and I go, oh my goodness. But if you can just do like one thing for yourself a day that you like doing, even if it's just for one minute or two minutes, and that's all you get the chance to do, it, it helps to raise your vibration. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this is also a call to action a bit, right? I mean, this is an advice and a call to action because I have these two questions at the end because gratitude journal, it's a call to action and it's a device. So, so people... I'll, I'll put all the links to whatever I've learned about gratitude journals. And so that's the call for action or call to action. And it's the advice from you. How yes. can people get in touch with you? If they say, I want to know more about right. Mandy. I'm actually developing a website. I don't have it out yet. But if you want to send me an email, it's, um, me, it's Mandy Morgan and it's M-A-N-D-I-M-O-R-G-A-N. And then it's dot be inspired and it's B E I N S 
P-I-R-E-D at gmail.com. So it's manforgan.beinspired at gmail.com. Wow. Yes. And uh, people, you will not be disappointed. And um, thank you for listening so far. And Mandy, thanks for your time. And, uh, thank you. It has not been too disturbing with my daughter coming in and out. She is lovely. I, she's I think lovely. she's wonderful. Fantastic energy. <laughs> yes. And I'm sure I would love to have a, another episode with you. And we'll look at what kind of topic we talk. Like your future, you mentioned that you would like to work with oceans and cleaning the oceans and i definitely want to work with cleaning the ocean so if anybody knows anything please let either oliver or myself know <laughs> yes so that is out for in this episode but let's see what um what we talk next time so Sounds for that great for that time all the listeners thank you for being here and yeah see you another time thank you